Welcome to Anchors of Truth, live from the 3ABN Worship Center. Get ready, get ready, get ready with Frank Fournier. Well, we welcome you to the Worship Center here in West Frankfort, Illinois. And uh, we're so happy that each one of you could be with us. And those of you that are joining us by radio and television, we welcome you as well. And uh, we're so happy that our speaker tonight is Frank Fournier. Uh, Frank was born and raised in a French-Canadian home, and he gave his heart to Jesus Christ when he was 25 years old. And uh, he's been sharing the Word ever since. He and his wife, Janet, are so active in ministry. In fact, uh, while he's running a ministry in Colorado, she is running a ministry uh, over in Tanzania and uh, a place called Eden Valley Foster Care Mission. Now, Frank and Janet have three children, their son, Jason, who is also a missionary, and uh, two daughters, Angela and Julia. Now, Frank's had all kinds of experience. He's, he's been president of the Woodland Park Foundation in Ontario. He's been a Bible teacher at Fountain View Academy. Uh, director of the Riverside Farm Institute in Zambia, Africa. This is a famous mission outpost. And then he's been executive vice president for the Outpost Centers of America. As I mentioned, he's in Colorado now and, and is the president of the Eden Valley Institute. And in addition, he is serving as president of ASI. And uh, as most of you know, this is a Christian organization of business people who are trying to present Christ in the marketplace. And we've been looking forward to this series. I, uh, last year when he did the keynote address at ASI, I mentioned to someone that we needed to get Frank uh, to come here and, and do one of our anchors. And then um, when Julia Ukano was here, she said, when you get a chance, you need to get Frank Fournier to, to do uh, one of your anchors. And I said, well, you know, I, I've thought of that, and I think that's a great idea, Julia. And, uh, but we, we're, everything is full. And then we had a cancellation. Jim Nix had to have surgery, and he's postponed the only uh, his knee, I think it was, and he uh, postponed until the spring when he will be coming back with a series on church history. And so this gave us an opening, and Frank has done everything to change his schedule in order to be with us, because when he finishes this series, he will immediately leave and fly overseas. I'll let him share with you uh, where he's going to be. I'd like for us to bow our heads right now and just have a moment of prayer. Father in heaven, we're just so thankful for the opportunity to study your word. We're so thankful, Lord, that you have given us the task of sharing the gospel to the world. I thank you for Frank and for his wife, Janet, and for their family and their commitment to sharing the gospel. And I pray, Lord, that you'll be with Frank tonight in a very special way. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon him, and may we really, truly get ready for the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his wonderful and powerful and loving name, we ask it. Amen. Well, before Frank comes, I'm going to invite John Lomacain one of my favorite people, one of my favorite singers, to come and sing The Refiner's Fire. There burns a fire with sacred heat White hot with holy flame And all who dare pass through its blaze 
will not emerge the same. Some as bronze and some as silver, some as gold, yet with great skill. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see your smiling faces. I trust we're going to have a tremendous blessing tonight. I'm going to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. We're in Revelation chapter 6. We're going to start with a little, just a short history here. As we all know, on October 22, 1844, Jesus entered into the most holy place of the sanctuary, for the purpose, according to Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, for the purpose of cleansing the sanctuary. That's what he was going to do there. But at the same time, he intended that his people on earth should be purified. This was going to be a dual purpose. This was going to happen at the same time. And you can read about that in Malachi chapter 3. In John 15, verse 3, it says, Ye are clean through, thy, through the word. This is what it says. And so God sends his word in order to cleanse his people. In, since 1844, he had a very special intention in cleansing his people. His people were to be cleansed by his word, of course, but very specific words. 
We often talk about the three angels' messages, and I believe with all my heart that the Lord sent the three angels' messages to cleanse God's people in the last days to have a very special effect. These messages, if received, if understood, if internalized, would form what we see in the scriptures in Revelation chapter 14, what we call the 144,000. These people, once they are done, once they are formed by God, uh, you can see in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, they have the Father's name written in their foreheads. They have God's character formed in them. It's amazing. Now, this is what God is looking to do for His people in the last days. And I wish that as a people, we would look at this more often because we need to understand where God is going if we're ever going to cooperate with Him. We need to cooperate with Him. Secondly, it says there that we're going to sing a new song. It's a new song because this song has never been sung by anyone in this world before. It's a song of victory such as no man has ever experienced before. And again, we need to have that in our, in our hearts and in our minds. This is where God is leading us. This is where we want to go to. This is where He's been wanting to bring us. Thirdly, it says that, he, that they are undefiled with women. Now we understand that women, in, in so far as Bible symbol is concerned, represents a church. If it's a good woman, then it's a good church. And if it's a defiled woman, then obviously it's a bad church. And these people are not corrupted with the false doctrines, the doctrines of false churches. Fourthly, it says that they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. Now, of course, Jesus isn't here at this, in this day and age. But if he was here, would you follow him? Would you go where he goes? Would you do as he does? This is the kind of people we're looking at. And fifth, they have no guile. They're childlike. They're innocent in heart. They're clean. They're pure. This is the kind of people they are. And in the end, it says they are faultless before the throne of God. What a beautiful picture of God's people in the last days. Once these people are formed by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, once they are formed, God fills them with His Holy Spirit in latter rain power, and then they go on, <clears throat> according to Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, to enlighten the whole world with the glory of God's character. Now, I'd like to have that experience, wouldn't you? This is our destiny. This is the reason that God raised the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There's no doubt in my mind. Yet it seems to me that as a people, we've never bought into this program. We've never fully bought into it, obviously, because we are still here. I'm told that the Lord would have come long ere this. Well, why hasn't He come? Except that as a people, we have never really bought into what He had in mind. Now. Um, this reminds me something that uh, like Moses went through in the wilderness. You remember when Moses was used of heaven to deliver God's people from Egyptian slavery. Two years after he delivered them, uh, two years after he was used of heaven to deliver these people, they came to the borders of Canaan and God said to these people, I want you to go in there and receive the land. Take the land, I'm giving it to you. Now you remember the people said, well, can we not send some spies in there to see what the land is like? Now friends, they really had no reason to go in there and spy the land. It was enough to have faith in God. And when God says, go in and take the land, we should have gone, on, gone in there and taken the land, right? But they wanted to go in because they wanted to see what they were up against. It's amazing to me, but it seems to me they wanted to have the last word. They wanted to make the decision instead of God making the decision. And what's also is very interesting is that you can find in the Bible where God says, I want you to send 12 spies in there. So they ask to send 12 spies. God commands them to send 12 spies. Why would he do that? He didn't need to do that. He could have gone in. He told them to go and take the land. He would have given them the land. Do you know why he told them to send 12 spies in there? Because he knew that they did not have faith to face what they were going to face face on that side. So he says, go in and send some spies. And then when they see the giants and the high walls and all the rest that they see in there, then obviously they're going to lose faith. And he wanted them to lose faith 
on the right side of the river, you understand. He knew this was going to happen, and he didn't want them on the other side of the river to lose faith, and so he allowed them to send 12 spies. But when the spies came back, of course, they had a negative, they had an evil report, and the whole camp lost faith. And with losing faith, obviously, they lost the opportunity that was given them. Now, I have a question for you. How long before God would give them another opportunity, do you think? 38 years. Now, you add two years to this 38, that's 40 years. Now, I don't know how you compute a generation, but it seems to me that 40 years is about a generation, isn't it? Apparently, God likes to give one opportunity per generation. Now, I don't know that that's exactly true all the time, but it appears to be that way right there. They were there one generation, and he waited until that generation was passed to give them another opportunity. And likewise, I wonder if God doesn't do the same for us. He moved from the holy place of the sanctuary into the most holy place of the sanctuary in 1844. And then it was not until 1888 until he sent two young men, Jones and Wagner, with a very special, a very precious message in order to excite the people over this issue of righteousness by faith because he intended at that point to give them our people, to give us another chance at going into the kingdom. But what did we do with this most precious message? What did that generation do with their opportunity? Well, friends, we squandered it. We negated the opportunity by our unbelief. That's what happened. Now what I'm going to say, um, we've had opportunities at different times since that time, and I can't just easily go from 40 years to 40 years to 40 years because it doesn't add up. But I know a little bit down the line, there, the Lord raised up a man by the name of A.G. Daniels and W.W. W. Prescott, and they brought back this issue of righteousness by faith to the church. But again, we did not take hold of this thing. In 1950, the Lord sent two young men from Africa who addressed the church and challenged the church with the idea of righteousness by faith. And again, it was not taken up. When I came into the church in the early 70s and in, in, in leading to the 80s, there was a huge emphasis on righteousness by faith in those days. Men like Morris Venden and Bill Lehman and Whelan and Short and Margaret Davis and all kinds of people bringing a lot of emphasis on righteousness by faith and some confusion too, I suppose. Nevertheless, the Lord was trying to reach His people with this idea and somehow we either do not understand, we did not receive it, we did not internalize it, I don't know what it is, whatever it might be, we are still here and this is the year what? 2013. Are we going to say with other unbelievers, the walls are too high, our sins are like giants in our, li in our lives, God's grace is insufficient, the bar is too high? No, no. Isn't it about time that as a people we looked at what God is trying to do for us and we had faith in the Word of God to go ahead with His program and not with our program? What is it with us? Ah, friends, we need to go forward. Now, obviously, something is wrong. Something is wrong. Now, as you know, we're going to do a little series here this week. And the series is on righteousness by faith in relation to the three angels' messages. It's an amazing title and it's, it's an amazing theme. I don't know that this preacher can do it any justice. I'm going to do the best I can with what I've got for sure. Uh, but it's, it's a huge issue. Because if God's people ever got a glimpse of this thing things are going to begin to change. And, and you, you, you're going to have to pray that the Holy Spirit takes hold of this guy. Now, in order to start, what I would like to do is start by identifying the problem that we're facing, the problem that we've had all along. I've had you turn to Revelation chapter 6. This is where we are, Revelation chapter 6. You might wonder what it is that I, these verses have anything to do with anything, but I'll try to make the link in a minute. We're in Revelation chapter 6. We're trying to identify the problem that we have before we can go on to identify the solution. We're going to start with verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. 
And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said to them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And we look at these verses and we scratch our heads and we say, well, what is that going to do with anything? Well, friends, I read all that not so much because of what it says in these verses, but because of what the modern day prophet has to say as a commentary to these verses. Do you know that she quotes these verses and then she jumps all the way to Revelation chapter 18 as if this was the natural sequence. Now, I've seen that, and I'm going to read that in a second, but I've always puzzled over this thing. Why should it be that way? So in 7 Bible Commentary, page 968, I read this, if I could see it. When the fifth seal was opened, this is the one we've just read, John the Revelator in vision saw beneath the altar the company that were slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now watch. After this came the scene described in the 18th of Revelation when those who are faithful and true are called out from Babylon. Wow. Now why does she do that? I mean, she reads the fifth seal and then she says after this comes Revelation chapter 18 verse 1 and you have to scratch your head and wonder why she reads that and why she went there. I mean, is there a reason for it? Well, obviously there must be a reason for it. And I have to speculate here because she doesn't tell us what the reason is. But can it be even possible? Well, let me go somewhere else first. By the way, if this is so, fifth seal, Revelation 18, what do you suppose should come next? Well, the second coming, right? It wouldn't be very far behind. What is the next seal, do you think? If you look at the sixth seal, and we're not going to read the whole thing, but you can start with verse 15. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Now what is this talking about? It's talking about the second coming of Jesus. So we have the fifth seal, we have Revelation 18, and then the sixth seal is the second coming of Jesus. Is it possible? And I'm not saying that it is here. I am not a prophet, nor am I a theologian. All that I can do is speculate in my mind. Is it possible that God's people were not ready at this time? That there was a time when Jesus intended to come, and God's people were not ready, and so he was held up, he couldn't come? Well, I know that that's true. Now, whether it relates to this or not, I can prove that God's people were not ready when God wanted to come, when Jesus wanted to come. And we don't have to go very far if you just go to the next verse in Revelation chapter 7. And I want to ask you a question before we look at Revelation chapter 7. God sends four angels in Revelation chapter 7. What did he send them to do? To hold back the winds of strife. I'm sorry, that's not so. Every time I ask that question, that's what everyone says. But that's what they end up doing. That's not what God sent them to do. And you can see that in verses 1 to 3. And after those things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the winds should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to, watch, hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor any tree, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. What did he send them to do? He sent them to destroy the earth. Jesus was coming and he was going to destroy everything. This is what this is all about. You can see a parallel passage to this in Ezekiel chapter 9. In Ezekiel chapter 9, the Lord says to six men with destroying weapons in their hands, go to Jerusalem. And to one of them he says, the one with the dressed in linen, which represents Jesus. He has a writer's ink horn in his hand. And he says, put a mark on the foreheads of those that sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in Jerusalem, in the world, in their own individual lives. 
And after this mark is put in their foreheads, by the way, that's the seal of God. After the seal of God has been placed in the foreheads of those who sigh and cry, he sends the men with the destroying weapons to start at the church, start with the elders at the church and destroy everything. That's the end of the world. This is the second coming of Jesus. This is the same thing that we see here. Yeah. Jesus wanted to come at us sometime. But God's people were not sealed in their foreheads with the seal of the living God. And so, what are the four angels holding? They're holding the winds. Winds of strife. Ah, but friends, that's not all that's held up. God cannot send His Holy Spirit until God's people are sealed in their foreheads with the seal of the living God. The last warning cannot be given. The time of trouble can't come. The seven last plagues can't fall. The battle of Armageddon can't be fought. And the second coming is delayed. Everything is on hold. God is waiting for a people to get serious about their Christian experience. He's waiting for the three angels' messages to take effect in the heart of God's people. And this is where we are right now. The, the year is 2013, almost turning over to 2014. Don't you suppose that it's about time? Oh, yeah. Do you know that there's something wrong with us? Yeah. If... We had to ask ourselves, is there anywhere in the Bible that describes what's wrong with God's last day people? Where would you go? <laughs> you, you know already, right? The Laodicean church. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. We're going to cut to the chase. We're going to go straight to verse 17 in Revelation chapter 3. Because you say, I am rich spiritually rich, increase with goods, have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now I want you to notice something in this verse. The word Laodicea means God or God's people judged or people judged. Did you notice that in the verse there are two judges? We are judging ourselves and we say we're in good shape. Rich and increase with good in need of nothing. We are God's true people. We have the truth. And we can look at all the other denominations or many of the other denominations and say, and say these people don't know what they're talking about. They don't know the Bible as we do. We are in good shape. And Jesus turns around and said, No. You are spiritually poor. You are spiritually blind. You are spiritually naked. You are miserable and wretched. And we're like, No. <laughs> And do you know what the bottom line is? Thou knowest not. Now there couldn't be anything worse. I mean, how, how big a deception is this? How would you like to be naked and not know it? Well, that wouldn't be very f much fun. Yeah. And if you were blind and you didn't know it, you'd be walking into all kinds of stuff. How can it even be possible? Yes. But that's what Jesus says. That's the situation we're in, and we don't know it. And friends, I would like to encourage us this evening to believe it. Believe it. This is the true witness that's speaking, and we have to judge against our own word and His word. Who are you going to believe? Yourself or Jesus? I would like to encourage us to believe Jesus because <laughs> He is the true witness, and we are not. Now, I'm going to illustrate what I'm trying to teach right now with three illustrations. If we have enough time, we'll get, all, we'll get through all three of them. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. We're in Matthew chapter 24. As you know, this is that great chapter where Jesus gives us all the signs of His coming. And He does an amazing job of it. We get to verse 36. We're nearly to the end of that chapter. Let's look at verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then Jesus, because he's coming to the end of the chapter, he wants to illustrate what he's been saying, all that he's been teaching. So in verse 37, we couldn't get a better illustration of, than this. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were 
eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now tell me, is there anything wrong with eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage? No, there's not anything wrong with that until eating and drinking and marrying becomes more important than eternal realities. And this is exactly what Jesus is trying to teach us here. As a people, we are interested in what this world has to give. If you will keep your finger here and go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to go to verse 31. As you know, this is the, the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon that Jesus has ever preached. We're going to look at starting with verse 31. I just really am taking a little side trip here, but how important it is, especially in the light that it's actually possible to put too much importance on the very things that are needed in this world, it seems like. And more importance there than on eternal realities. Look at verse 31. Jesus speaking says, Therefore, take no thought. Don't worry yourselves saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Jesus wants us to waste no brain energy on clothing and eating and drinking and making money and having houses and all of these things. Verse 32, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Who are the Gentiles? I think the word Gentiles mean ungodly or people without God. And so if people have no God, then they only have one thing to think about. And it's the things that belong to this earth, right? To this world. They have to worry about what they're going to eat and drink. They have to worry about what they're going to wear, if they're going to have a house, if, they're going, if their marriages will survive, and if they're going to have a car, if they're going to make enough money, and if their children will survive. And oh, there's no end to the thing you can worry about in this world. But Jesus says, don't waste any time worrying about these things. Why? Well, first of all, because that's what people without God worry about, and we are not without God. And the second thing is, in the rest of the verse, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. What's implied here? Do you know what's implied? That God will supply all these things. Well, if God is going to supply them, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. It's amazing. God is relieving us of a lot of responsibility here. God is relieving us of a lot of worry here. We don't have to worry about the things of this world. I'll supply all of that if you will focus in on what I care about. Verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God to enlarge it, and the righteousness of God so that you can have the character of Jesus Christ. And I will give you everything. You will have nothing lacking. How easy is that? Well, I'm not saying it's really easy to be just like Jesus because I have a long way to go. But still in all, if that's my focus, Jesus has promised to supply all the rest. Isn't that a fantastic promise? And doesn't it relieve us of a lot of worry over nothing? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 24. The people in the days of Noah were just like that. They were s s focused on this world and the things of this world. And God wanted to take care of them and have them focus on eternal realities. Well, we're looking at verse um, 39 now. And notice the first three words, and knew not. Hmm. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And so, what will be wrong with God's people in the last days? The same thing that was wrong with the people in the days of Noah. They knew not, thou knowest not. Now, what is it that the people in the days of Noah didn't know? That there would be a flood? Oh, no, they knew that there would be a flood. Hey, Noah, for 120 years, preached that there was coming a flood. And he he backed up all his preaching by building a huge boat on top of a dry hill in a land that had never seen rain. He believed it. There was no doubt about it. His sermon was backed up with action. That's what it was. The people knew that there was going to be a flood. At least they had heard that there would be a flood. The thing that they didn't know was God. They didn't know Him. They had not walked with Him. They'd not been heart to heart, arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder. 
with God. He never had the opportunity to rescue them when they were in trouble because they never turned to him. They did not know him. Now what's amazing, you know, if you think of faith, God said, if anyone gets into that ark, I'll save them. Now how much faith would it take to walk up a gangplank and go into an ark? It wouldn't take very much faith. Ah, but that isn't the issue, and we all realize it. But to turn your back on your friends and to turn your back on your family and to embrace a crazy man's wild prediction, that's another matter altogether. And friends, you and I are going to face the same thing. We are going to be asked to turn our backs on family, on friends, on wealth, on property, on position, on our ambitions. And what for? For a message that will bring all hell down upon our heads. Yes. Where if you study Revelation chapter 13, you're going to see that God's last day people are going to come to the place where they will not be able to buy or sell. Every earthly support will be cut off according to Desire of Ages 161. And then there's going to come a death decree. Do you know how many things we're dependent on today that we find support in today? Why? Everything. There's no end to it. You need gas stations, you need a car, you need your, you know, we, support, we find support in our own families, we find support in our friends, we find support at Walmart, we find support, I mean, everything that's going on in this world, we gain support from. Every earthly support will be cut off. Now listen, if you find support nowhere, you're left alone to stand, you and God alone in a, in a, in a world that's, uh, phew, is trying to kill you? Are you going to survive this thing? Are you going to have enough faith to believe that God will carry you through? How are you going to get that kind of faith? Can you see? We've got to get it now. We've got to be able to believe that whatever happens is the best thing that happens because there's a God in heaven who, who <laughs> is the orderer of all our experiences. And the Ministry of Healing 417 says, He only orders that which His providence sees best. If we could see the end from the beginning, we would choose no other way to be led. That's what we're told. If only we could see. But we can't see. But we can live by faith. We can trust Him who can see. And the thing that's happening to you is the best thing that can be happening to you because God is behind the curtain. And He's organizing everything. He's preparing us for a time that is coming. And it's going to be a rough time. As far as I can tell, it's going to be a rough time. It's a very practical thing, this thing. You know, I, somebody mentioned that I, no, maybe not. Let me mention it now in any case. I worked for nine and a half, half years in the mines, nickel and copper mines in Sudbury, Ontario, in, in Canada. Do you know that I was making $100 a day working in the mines 40 years ago? Now, that might not seem like a lot today. I don't know uh, because I haven't made that kind of money since. Yeah. I built a house when I was 20 years old. I married my wife when I was 20, and I was able to bring her into a house that was already built. 20 years old, I had a new car in the driveway. I had the toys of the age, hunting and fishing equipment. That's what it was, you know. And when I turned my sights to the Word of God and to God Himself, He tapped me on the shoulder and He said, I want you to come and follow, sell everything you have. Come and follow me. And I did it. And I joined a little work, Outpost Centers International. And in this little work, do you know what I was getting for a stipend for about seven years? $20 a month. Now, is there a difference between $100 a day and $20 a month? Oh, yes, there's a difference. But do you know that I have never lacked anything? I have been in this work for 38 years, and I still stand. I'm not very fat, but I'm still standing. <laughs> yeah, the Lord is good. Now, I have tasted and I have experienced it, and the Lord has had to rescue me out of all kinds of troubles. And I know that the Lord is good. Well, what happens to an individual whose whole Christian experience is intellectual? What happens to an individual who's never tried God's promises, who's never had to be rescued by Jesus, who's never known His faithfulness? They won't be able to trust Him. And how we can't wait until that day. We've got to walk with Jesus now. Because right now we're in trouble. Thou knowest not. Illustration number two. Turn with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. 
And we're going to go to verse 41. This is the Sunday before Jesus' crucifixion. As a matter of fact, it's called the triumphal entry. He's sitting on a donkey and he's climbing a little hill. People are throwing palm branches and their jackets on the ground. They're going to proclaim him king. And as he crests the hill, looking over Jerusalem, he spies Jerusalem and all of a sudden he's convulsed with, with sorrow. He's weeping such as no man has ever wept and the people are scratching their heads wondering what in the world he's going to be crowned king and he's crying this way. What's wrong? Jesus is getting a glimpse of Jerusalem and he sees what's coming and he's broken hearted by this thing. Verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, if thou hadst known even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Could they have known? Oh yeah. Did they know? Apparently not. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and they shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. Why? Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. What is it they didn't know? That Jerusalem would be destroyed? Well, friends, they didn't know Jerusalem would be destroyed. They didn't. Ah, he was telling them, and I suppose he told them more than once, but who was he? If a stranger came to town today wearing a batter board and it said on there that your city is going to be destroyed, escape for your life, would you run? Well, probably not, especially if he's a stranger and you think he has a strange message and you don't believe it. And this is what they were facing. Oh, they knew Jesus. There was no doubt that they knew who he was. They knew his mother. They knew his father. They knew his claims. But the problem with that, of course, is he made claims for being the Messiah. But he did not meet their expectations as they thought the Messiah would meet them. And because he did not meet their expectations, they could not believe what he said because obviously if he's deceiving us here, then whatever he says might be a deception also. And so they could not credit the words that they were hearing. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But friends, this is the point. They were religious people. They were God's chosen people. They were Bible students. They had been to rabbinical schools. They had been to the schools of the prophets. They were educated in the Word of God. But they misinterpreted the prophecies. They built up false expectations. And because he did not agree with their expectations, they rejected him. Friends, they did not know him. They didn't know who he was. Oh, he told them, but they could not accept that. And therefore, you know what happened. Now, do you think this could happen to us? Do you think? Friends, it's not that it can happen to us. It's the very thing that will happen to us. There's no choice in this matter. God has always operated that way. He comes to His own and He comes always in a way as to surprise them. Why does He do that? That's what happened in the days of Jesus. Why did He come? Why didn't He come giving them what they expected? If He had been willing to overthrow the Romans and, to set it and come there as a king, they all would have received Him. But he didn't, did he? Now, in 1844, how many people were disappointed because they believed that Jesus was going to come October 22, 1844? How many people lost their faith because their expectations were not met? Why did he do that? He could have told them. He could have revealed it before what was really going on. But he didn't, did he? In 1888, he sends two young men with a very special message on righteousness by faith. And the people were saying, well, how can he bypass our leaders and go to two young upstarts? They're overthrowing everything. That can't possibly come from God. Well, let me ask you, if God had wanted to, don't you suppose he could have sent the messages through G.I. Butler and Uriah Smith? Don't you suppose? Yes, he could have done that. And if he had done that, the people would have received it probably. Well, why didn't he do that? Wasn't the point for them to get the message? No, that wasn't the point at all. The point was to separate the sheep from the goats. 
The point was to determine who it was that really had a sensitivity to spiritual reality. The point is the same in the end of days. God is going to send us a surprise that's going to have us, our heads spinning, and only those who hear His still small voice, only those who feel in, uh, uh, the wafting of an e angel wing as it flies by are going to be able to detect where it is that God is going. How spiritual are you? How much in tune are you with Jesus? Do you walk with Him? Do you know when He's going contrary to expectations? This is how sensitive we need to become. This is who we need to become. We're in um, illustration number three now. Turn with me to Luke chapter 22. We're in Luke chapter 22. We're looking at verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Simon, Simon, God wants to send a shaking your way. Satan is the instrument, and you're going to be shaken. Was Peter shaken? Oh, yes, he was shaken. Has God promised us a shaking as a church? What do we know is going to be the outcome of this church being shaken? Do you remember? The great majority will be shaken out. Whoa, that's not pleasant, is it? That's not a pleasant thought. I mean, if this hall was full packed, and the great majority would be shaken out, what would be left? In the days of Noah, I don't know how many millions of people there were, but only eight entered into the ark. Two million people leaves Egypt, and how many actually make it into the land of Canaan from that group? Only two. Jesus comes to his own, and his own receive him not. A handful of people know who he is because they're spiritually sensitive. Yeah. 50,000 people, somebody said 500,000. I don't know how many there were in 1844 expecting Jesus to come. I don't know, but a handful of them was left to go in the direction that he wanted us to go. What's it going to be like in the last day? Will there be a shaking? There will be a shaking. How many are going to be left? I can't tell you, but I know that the great majority will be shaken out. What's interesting is that some will be shaken in. And some will be shaken out. Why? How does that happen? In the story of Jesus, Peter was shaken in. Judas was shaken out. Why? Well, I've had to think about this thing. And I, you know, I, you have to think, I guess. And you have to form an opinion. There's no doubt. Anyway, just look at Peter. Jesus had told him that before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice, right? And when he did deny him thrice, the cock crew, and what happened to Peter? Do you know? He looked at Jesus, and Jesus looked at him. And there was a tear running down Jesus' cheek. What did it do to Peter? Ah, it broke his heart. But he read something in that tear. He read forgiveness. He went out and wept bitterly. And he went out and repented bitterly also. Because he knew that Jesus loved him. And he had broken Jesus' heart. And it drew him to Jesus. Ah, but Judas has the same experience. Judas was the one that betrayed him. Do you know that Judas came back? And he came back to the high priest. And Jesus was standing beside the high priest, a prisoner. Probably his hands were tied behind his back. And Judas comes back and he has a handful of coins, 20 silver coins, and he throws them at the feet of the high priest and he says, I have betrayed innocent blood. And the high priest said, so, who cares? Do with it what you want, you know. Do you think, and I know it's not written anywhere, do you think there's, not, there's even a chance that Judas didn't look at Jesus? that Jesus didn't look at Peter? Do you think there's a chance that their eyes didn't meet? Now, I don't know that there was a tear running down Jesus' cheek, but I wouldn't be surprised. I know that he loved Judas as much as he loved anyone else. And so Judas looks at Jesus, and Jesus looks at Judas, and there's a tear, and what's happening in Judas's heart? He's saying to himself, if someone had done that to me, I'd hang, I'd hang him. So he went out and hung himself. 
because he did not see forgiveness in Jesus. All the time that he was with Jesus, approximately three, three and a half years, all the time that he was with Jesus, he thought himself superior to Jesus. He always wanted to tell Jesus how this thing, how this little program should be run so as to have success. He was not going to receive instruction from Jesus. So he had no confidence in Jesus. He had never tried him in spite of the fact that they had been together all this time. Yeah. So he had no basis for having any faith. Isn't that amazing? Well, what about us? We've got to have a basis for faith also. Have you, have you tried Jesus in the fullest sense of the word? Have you taken a risk with him? Mm. Verse 32 and 33. Jesus is still speaking to Peter. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both into prison and to death. Now something's wrong with Peter here, right? Yeah. Do you know what's wrong with Peter? Well, first of all, He's not converted. Now, friends, you have to understand what this is saying here. He was converted enough to be a disciple of Jesus, and you and I are that converted. He was, the same, he was converted enough to keep the Sabbath. You and I are that converted. He was converted on many things, and you and I are that converted. But Jesus could come to him and say, you are not fully converted. You are not converted enough to meet the trial that you're facing. Are we converted enough to meet the trial that we're facing? That's what was wrong with Peter. And the second thing that was wrong with Peter was that he is unbelieving. He's looking, as a matter of fact, if you went to Matthew chapter 16, and you don't have to go to Matthew chapter 16, but if you went to Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asked a question there. Who do men say that I am? And they gave, them, they gave Jesus a list of men they thought that perhaps he was. Then he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, it's Peter that's speaking. Thou art the son of the living God. I know who you are. And it was so dead on that Jesus could commend Peter for saying, Hey, no man has told you this. The Father in heaven has revealed it to you. You know who I am. Well, did he? We come down the pike here. We come down later. And now Jesus tells him, You're going to be shaken. You're going to have a heart. I'm praying for you because this is going to be rough. And Peter says, well, you don't know what you're talking about. Why? I, I'll go to prison and I'll go to death with you. You don't know. But can you face God? Can you look him in the eye and say, you don't know what you're saying? But isn't that? Yeah, well, we're going we're to see that in a minute. The third thing that Peter didn't know was himself. He didn't know himself. And that's obvious, isn't it? So what's wrong with Christianity today? Unbelieving. The true witness comes to us and said, you think you're rich and increased with good. You're not. You're not. You are spiritually poor. You're spiritually blind. You're spiritually naked. Believe it. Because if you could believe it, then you would know that you have need of my help. You're not all that there is. The second thing is that they don't, we don't know ourselves. We're facing something and we don't know how we're going to come through this thing. And we will not come through this thing any better than Peter. And hopefully we'll come through this thing better than Judas. Ah, friends, we need God's help, don't you think? The third thing that we don't know is that we're not converted. If you'll turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Now, some of you are going to say, now wait a minute, that's going too far. <laughs> no, no. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. We're in the... Um, the Laodicean message here, we're going to look at verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Who's speaking here? Jesus is. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice, my word, and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Now, where is Jesus, inside or out? Oh, he's outside? Oh, no, no, Jesus is in my heart. Have you ever heard people say, Jesus is in my heart? Is he really? How is it then? Now, I'm not here to say that Jesus is not in your heart individually. But let me tell you something. He's speaking to us as a church. 
And apparently the great majority have Jesus standing outside. Therefore, you can say, we can say, until we're blue in the face, that Jesus is in my heart. But it may not be so just because we say so. Because the true witness says, I am standing, knocking at the door, wanting entrance. And I don't have entrance. Thou knowest not. How serious is that? How is it with you? Are you ready to admit that you need help in this area? That you may not know all that you need to know in this respect? Friends, we have to admit it. I can stand, isn't it weird? I can stand here and tell us we don't know and be one of those who doesn't know. <laughs> Praise the Lord that, that the Lord will use people and he will speak the truth to them even though I need it as well as anyone else. I am determined to believe that this is true. And if this is true, then I have to take the steps necessary to bring myself into line, not that I can bring myself. Oh, really, friends, it's a matter of getting on my knees with God and asking Him for the gift of a new heart that He's promised. Has He promised us a new heart? Has He promised to renew the right spirit in us? Has He promised to raise a people called the 144,000 without fault before God? Really? Having the character of the Father and having His name in their foreheads? He's promised to do it. He can do it for us. How much do we want it? That's the issue. That's the issue. I would like to ask you to bow, and we're going to pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we have such needs. We are such a small people. We have formed ideas and expectations in our minds that may not be true. We are ignorant. We are weak. But you said that the weak things of this world are going to confound the mighty. And we'd like to see ourselves as you see us so that we can lean on you all the more. Oh, Heavenly Father, glorify thyself in us, we pray. Bless us this rest of this week as we now go in to study what the solution is to our situation. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. And we'll see you all tomorrow night.